going to be working with this gorgeous Royston turquoise stone for this statement turquoise necklace. And if you haven't already, feel free to check out my previous two videos to see how I made the sterling silver leaves and sterling silver flowers that I'm going to be using to adorn this turquoise stone. To get started, I'm going to be using 26 gauge fine silver serrated wire for my bezel. Now I'm just going to take this wire and wrap it snugly around the stone. And where the two ends overlap, I'm just going to make a mark with my sharpie so I know where to trim the wire. Now I want to make sure that the two ends are flush before I solder them together. And what I like to do is just work hard in the two ends using my flat nose pliers. Now using my Bench Basic Smart Flux, I'm just going to apply a little bit of flux to that seam. I'm then going to take a small piece of hard solder and place it right in between the seam. I'm now going to slowly heat the entire bezel and allow the solder to flow. Now the bezel fits perfectly, it's nice and snug. However, I do notice that the bezel isn't quite the perfect shape of the stone, so I'm just gonna use my workbench and gently press the bezel into the stone so it takes on the proper shape. Now I also noticed that I have a little bit of excess solder at that seam, so what I'm going to do is use a white coarse silicone polishing wheel to just clean up that excess solder. Now I'm going to get ready to solder the bezel to the back plate, but what I'm first going to do is just sand the bottom of the bezel so it sits nice and flat and even on the back plate. Now I'm going to be using medium solder to solder the bezel to the back plate, and I'm just going to alternate between heating underneath the piece and above the piece. As you can see, we had a successful solder operation for the bezel. Now what I'm going to do is just take easy solder wire and place it around the bezel. And I'm going to be doing this to sweat solder my decorative embellishments to the back plate. Now that I have all of the decorative embellishments carefully placed on the back plate, I can get ready to solder them down. What I'm first going to do is slowly heat the piece from below, and then I'm going to alternate between heating the piece above and below throughout the entire soldering process. I want to make sure not to overheat any of the decorative embellishments because they could melt. Now since I'm using a butane torch, it's not as powerful as other torches out there so the soldering process can take a bit longer than usual. Once the piece is soldered, I'm just going to put it in a bowl of water to quench it and then I'm going to place it in my pickle pot. And here it is, nice and clean, fresh out of the pickle pot. Now I'm going to get ready to saw this piece out and I'm going to be using 5 aught nano saw blades from Pepe Tools to do this. Sawing out the piece can be quite tedious. I like to go as slow as I possibly can and try to get as close to the decorative elements. That way I have less cleanup to do at the end.
Once I have my piece all sawed out, I then like to go back once again with my saw blade and really try to cut into those tight corners and crevices and fine tune the shape of the piece. I like to look at my saw blade as a tiny little file to get into any tight corners. Now I'm going to be using these needle files to fine tune the shape of the piece even more. I have a, a variety of different shapes and sizes I like to alternate between using depending on my need. Now I'm going to be using a white silicone polishing wheel to once again fine tune the shape of the piece and smooth out the edges. I then am going to use this black knife edge silicone polishing wheel to really get into those tight corners and try to remove any marks made by my saw blade and by my files. And as you can see the piece is looking pretty good. Now using a sharpie, I'm just going to mark where I want to place my bail on the back of my piece. I'm going to be using 12 gauge round sterling silver wire for my bail and I'm just going to cut off a small piece of that wire and I'm going to use painters tape to tape the wire in place and hold it in place while I hammer it. Now I'm just going to gently hammer one end of that wire. And I'm going to be using these pliers to twirl the other end of the wire. I want to create a small little loop which I'm then going to trim and flatten the opposite end where it was hammered so it sits nice and flat on the back plate. Now I'm just going to sand my bale nice and flat before I solder it to the back plate. I want to make sure that there's absolutely no gaps in between the bale and the back plate when I go to solder it down. I'm also going to make my maker's mark which will be soldered to the back plate as well. And I'm just going to be using scrap silver for this part. I like to use a ruler and a sharpie to draw a straight line on my silver. Where I'm using numerous stamps for my maker's mark, this line helps to make sure that I stamp all of my stamps in a straight even line. Now I'm going to be using cutting shears to just finish cutting out the rest of the stamp. And I'm going to be using a sanding drum with my rotary tool to fine tune the shape some more and round out the corners. Now I'm going to be using a ruler to once again draw a straight line on the back plate so I can line up the bale with my maker's mark. I'm going to be using the technique of sweat soldering to solder my maker's mark to my back plate. So all I'm going to do is just flex my piece and slowly heat it and then apply my solder to the back of my maker's mark and I'll heat that again and allow the solder to flow.
I'm now going to get ready to solder my Maker's Mark in Bale to my back plate, and I'm going to be using that black Sharpie line that I drew for reference to make sure everything is straight and aligned. Now sometimes during the soldering process, things like to shift and move around. So what I like to do is use my third hand tweezers to hold my Maker's Mark in place so it can't move around during the soldering process. Now, as you can see, as I begin to heat my piece, and as the flux starts to bubble a little bit, my bale has started to shift and move, so I'm just gonna use my solder pick to move it back into place. Alrighty, and as you can see, we had a successful soldering operation, but now we do have some cleanup to do. I'm going to start with a white 1 inch 3M radial disc to just do a rough cleanup of the back plate and remove any excess solder or deep scratches or grooves in my metal. Now I did notice there was a section where there was some solder that overflowed, so what I'm going to do is use this black silicone polishing wheel to remove that excess solder. As you can see that looks so much better now, but I am going to go back with my 3M radial discs and just remove any streaks made with those silicone polishing wheels. Now I'm going to be switching to my smaller 3M radial discs. These ones are 3 fourths of an inch and I'm going to be using these to polish my entire piece. Now these wheels come in numerous different grits and each grit has a different color. I have found that I get the best results when I go in order using all of the grits. I start with my yellow disc and then I go to my white and then my red and then my blue, and then my pink, and then my peach, and then I finish with my light green wheel. Now if you want, you can end your polishing with the blue radial disc and this will leave your piece with a nice satin finish. I however am going to continue with my pink, peach and green discs because I want to give my piece a little more of a shinier finish. Alrighty, now that I'm all done with my radial discs, I'm going to throw my piece in a tumbler for a little bit. I like to use distilled water and Dawn dish soap in my tumbler. A tumbler is great for smoothing out all of your edges and removing any light scratches in the piece. I usually leave my piece in the tumbler for about two to three hours.
Now, while my piece tumbles, I'm just going to take a quick lunch break. Now I'm just going to simply wash away all the soapy water from my piece and as you can see it now has a nice shiny bright surface. I'm now going to be oxidizing the piece but I'm going to be using some very powerful and toxic substances so I want to make sure to wear gloves and a mask and reference the safety instructions on the bottle before I begin. I'm going to be using distilled water along with baking soda to create a neutralizing bath. Once you're done oxidizing your piece, you're then going to want to stick it in this bath to neutralize the acid. I'm going to be using this plastic paintbrush to apply the oxidizer to my piece. Now I learned that my original paintbrush that I was using had an aluminum handle on it and the aluminum was reacting with my oxidizer and causing my oxidation to discolor over time. So I have switched to this plastic paintbrush and it works much, much better. Now once I'm done applying my oxidizer to my piece, I'm then going to stick it into my neutralizing bath. Now I'm going to be using these foam polishing pads to remove the excess patina on my piece. I found these pads on Amazon and I have to say they are one of my favorite ways to remove my excess patina. They're super aggressive but they also allow you to have full control over where you are removing the patina on your piece and where you might want to keep it to accentuate any sort of details on the piece. Now I'm going to be using the Zam Polishing Compound along with the Muslin Wheel, or Muslin Wheel, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, to give my piece a nice high shine. Now to remove any remaining polishing compound on my piece, I'm going to be using dish soap along with the Soft Bristle Toothbrush. And I'm just going to gently scrub my piece under warm water to remove any remaining compound. Now I'm going to get ready to set the stone and I'm going to be using a combination of three different tools to do this. Now I have found that the slower and more patient I am during the stone setting process, the less likely I am to break or scrape a stone. I really try to take my time with this step and I alternate between using all three tools depending on what I'm trying to accomplish. If I'm just going to be setting along a straight edge, I like to use my bezel roller. If I'm trying to get into any tight corners, I'll use my steel pusher or I'll use my burnisher. Now I have gotten asked quite a few times in the comment section of my previous videos whether I use any sort of glue or adhesive when setting my stone and the answer is I do not. I make my bezel very snug and tight so that way when I go to set my stone there's absolutely no wiggle room at all for my stone.
Now on to the necklace chain. I'm going to be using an 18 inch wheat sterling silver chain. And to answer your question, I do not make my own necklace chains. I have found that that is a whole nother um, sort of art in itself. But anyways, so what I'm first going to be doing is oxidizing that necklace chain. And I'm going to be using the same safety measures that I used earlier in my video when oxidizing the entire piece. And once it's oxidized, I'm just gonna neutralize it once again. Now I'm gonna be using my favorite foam polishing pads once again to remove the excess patina from my necklace chain. Alrighty, and the last step is to simply just string the necklace chain through the hidden bail on the back, and you are ready to go. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and please don't forget to like and subscribe, and feel free to leave any questions or comments in the video section below. Thanks, guys!